Sociality, or living together, may be taken for granted by us humans, since we're arguably the most social animal on the planet. And living together is the standard for most higher animals, like birds and mammals. But it's not the case for all animals. Many are solitary throughout their entire lives, except in the few instances when they may need to mate with another animal of their own species. So many lower animals live alone, from sponges, through worms, to clams, and insects. So many of them will rarely interact with others of their own species. And yet, social behaviors have evolved so many times more recently among the vertebrates. If living together in social groups has evolved and persisted so consistently among higher animals, it must confer some important evolutionary benefits over living alone. Of course, there are many benefits to animal sociality, but like all behaviors, they do not come for free. There's always another side to that coin that shows the costs that may come from social living as well. Atlantic herrings swim in large shoals of thousands of individuals that benefit mutually from one another in finding upwellings of zooplankton that they will feed on vigorously. Also, a larger group will benefit from having more eyes on the scene and be able to alert others of danger. But when that danger is imminent, grouping can become a defensive act because there's safety in numbers. Due to the risk dilution effect, a tangible benefit of being together is that social animals are less susceptible to predation than loners are. Schooling is a particular form of shoaling, where the fish all swim tightly together in a ball, particularly when predators are nearby. This would act to improve the protective effect of risk dilution by being as close as possible to other fish and not out on your own. An incidental effect of these schooling masses is that they sometimes confuse predators by overwhelming their senses. Predator fish detect and locate individual fish prey using their lateral line system along the body. Or, in the case of sharks, their electromagnetic detection organs found in pits along their faces. When the fish swim around in tight schools, the predators are not able to distinguish the individual fish from one another, and they have a hard time knowing where to focus their attention during their attempts to decide which one to chase after. In these shoals of herring, and many other types of prey fish, their communal living arrangements can mean the difference between life and death. The benefits to hanging out together seem clear, compared to going it alone out in the large and lonely expanse of open ocean. Life isn't always bread and roses in the lives of social animals, and many disadvantages can be found to result of living in close quarters to others of your species. In the colonial nesting cliff swallows, the proximity of nest entrances to one another, such as you see on this cliff, leads to a situation where blood-sucking parasitic swallow bugs can readily climb from one nest to another and proliferate while attacking the young chick nestlings within. The swallow bug is very similar to a bed bug such as this one. Getting bitten by a bed bug is no fun for a human. For a creature as tiny as a swallow hatchling, the stress and irritation caused by these parasites, as well as the loss of energy and nutrients, leave the young underdeveloped and sickly, not in a good position to start their lives independently out of the nest and into the real world. As a result, swallows that were plagued by parasites as nestlings do not survive as well, and the consequences of living in those high-density habitations in their youth has shown to have negative consequences later on in life. When resources are limited, having more individuals around can lead to competition and impacting almost everyone in the population, when there just isn't enough food to go around for all the extra mouths to feed. 
The fieldfare birds are a kind of thrush that live in small colonies among wooded habitats of northern Europe. Feeding on a wide variety of food, including insects and worms, seeds and berries. These colonial birds presumably benefit from living together by having more eyes on the lookout for predators and to survive better than they would by living alone. However, researchers have found that as colony size increased to around 24 adult birds, the nestling survival rate dropped by almost half compared to those breeding pairs that did so somewhere else alone. The increase in competition for food meant that the birds were not able to make as many of their offspring survive, and clearly, living in a social environment can come with important costs. For animals that occupy large feeding grounds, like great ocean depths that king penguins will dive as they hunt for fish and squid, they are happy to find a huge colony to return to when it comes time to find a mate. These social penguins create huge gatherings of several hundreds of thousands of individuals on their breeding grounds in the Falkland Islands and northern Antarctica. Those penguins that are still single come the breeding season will gather on the periphery of the massive mating population to mingle, strut their stuff, and hook up with a partner that they will stay together with for the remainder of the breeding year. These large mating markets allow for pairings of king penguins of all sizes and preferences that would have a hard time dating if it weren't for these social gatherings, and they help to contribute to the evolution of such social behaviors. Some animals live together because they benefit from a mutual infrastructure and societal kickbacks that come from being part of their group. This is particularly true for social animals that live in colonial hives or nests that bring about many advantages that only coordinated group efforts can bring about. Social insects, like ants and wasps, live in elaborate nests with many specialized chambers and layers that were only made possible through the collective effort of hundreds of worker individuals. Likewise, naked mole rats live in extended networks of underground tunnels and chambers that lead to important rhizome and tuber food resources. No single naked mole rat could excavate such a structure on their own, and its creation is an emergent property of the committed effort of their society's working class. Australian termites build mounds that house thousands of individuals and provide them with protection, as well as solar heating and air conditioning. The mounds are built in such a way as to only capture the early morning and late afternoon sun, and to maximize the flow of air currents throughout the day by crafting its architecture so as to provide the ideal environment within for these insects, despite the scorching temperatures on the outside. In any of these cases, an individual ant, naked mole rat, or termite could in principle decide to leave its social group and try to make a go of it on their own, but they would also be leaving behind all of the benefits of the combined efforts of their group, and they could never have the chance of rebuilding it on their own. In these cases, living in social groups is not only readily understood in terms of the benefits of being together, but also in the high costs of what it would take to try to make it out in the world alone instead. When animals live together and interact, all sorts of social behaviors are bound to evolve. One important product of social behavior is helping, as it can have the effect of improving the fitness of both the helper and the helpee. Because maladaptive behaviors are weeded out by natural selection over time, we have to note that helping must be adaptive, even if it looks like it is costly to those that are making a sacrifice for the benefit of others. As we shall see, helping behavior, or altruism, is rarely selfless, and there's always something of importance in it for those that are going out of their way to appear generous to the others. That payoff can be immediate and mutually beneficial to all individuals that perform the helping behavior, such as the case of pack-hunting animals, like wolves or lions, that are capable of bringing down large prey, much to the immediate benefit of the whole pack, who get to eat something that they wouldn't have been able to kill on their own. In other instances, there can be a delay between the helping act and its payoff reward. This is the concept behind the saying, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. Although the way it plays out in the real world is more like, okay, 
I'll scratch your back now, but when the time comes that I start to get an itchy back, I'm coming looking straight for you, pal, and you better come through for me. This form of reciprocal altruism involves having debts and repayments among the individuals in a social group, and it relies on well-established relationships and long-term memory to keep track of the social ledger. Vampire bats roost in colonies in caves during the day and emerge at night to feed on the blood of a mammal or bird somewhere. These small and warm-blooded animals have a high metabolic rate and need to feed every night or risk dying of starvation. But it can be a challenging hunt for a sleeping mammal or bird that will remain still for long enough for the bat to make a small incision and drink a tummy full of blood. Any bat that needs to return to the roost with an empty stomach because they were unsuccessful in their feeding expedition the night before will be risking death by doing so unless they can count on a friendly bat indeed, in their moment of critical need. Impoverished and famished bats will solicit help from their roost mates and will often receive a small amount of regurgitated blood from one of their closer compatriots. This small gesture will not cost the donor much from their already satiated belly, but it means the world to the recipient of that much-needed help, and they're not likely to forget about it. That's the point, you see. Because there may come a time when the friendly donor bat will be unlucky in their own feeding trips some evening in the future, and they know that they have someone they can count on and will call upon them to return the favor. These reciprocal favors are adaptive because they will improve the fitness of a helper if it buys them some insurance to get out of trouble when they need it in the future. Of course, this kind of honor system relies on trust, and on following through with your end of the bargain when you're called upon to do so. That's why cheaters are quickly shunned and may lose their privileges for receiving help in the future. Such is the case with tamarind monkeys, who remember whether another has been helpful or not, and will take this into account when it comes time to consider helping one of their colleagues or not. Researchers found that when lab-raised tamarind monkeys are allowed to provide food for a neighbor tamarind, by pulling a food lever that the other can't reach, that those individuals seemed pleased to return the favor when their positions were switched. However, if a monkey was in control of the food lever and the neighbor had previously been unhelpful, that first monkey would often decide not to pull the lever and release food to the selfish lab mate as a punishment for breaking the code of conduct, which is based on a mutual trust for following through on the contract. Some birds are known to delay their own reproduction, either by choice or by luck of the draw in the mating game, and instead of sitting things out, they'll work hard as secondary helpers at their parents' nest and contribute to the care of their younger siblings. This is the case for young male pied kingfishers that are entering their breeding age. If they're not successful in finding a mate, they'll in turn invest their time and effort into helping their parents raise the next brood of sibling chicks. This season of volunteer childcare does take its toll on the young kingfishers, but the advantages exist on more than one level. Firstly, their fatherly devotion to caring for young chicks does not go unnoticed by the young females in his population, and those non-breeding helper males find themselves with a high market value when they go back to the dating scene the following year. However, the evolutionary forces may be more pervasive than just on the superficial level of impressing the ladies with his domestic abilities. The secret to this adaptive success lies at the genetic level, where the offspring he's helping out have a high coefficient of relatedness to him, and this degree of genetic similarity helps to drive these helping behaviors. Because closely related individuals will share more genes in common than they do with others, there can be selection to help those common genes find their way into the next generation, irrespective of which individual is the ultimate vessel for that process. In fact, if helping behaviors allow more closely related offspring to survive than would have without that help, it will benefit the helpers in an indirect genetic manner by ensuring that some proportion of genes inside of them will be present in the next generation via the successful reproduction of a close family member. 
In order to understand the genetic consequence of the non-breeding kingfisher helping behavior, the inclusive fitness would be calculated as the sum of his indirect fitness from helping raise siblings, plus his own direct fitness of successfully reproducing the following year. By looking at the inclusive fitness of the helping behavior, we can see that the non-breeding helping behavior is in fact more adaptive than sitting things out and waiting for the next year to try to mate again. The helping behavior of young male kingfishers may seem noble, but other animals will make a lifetime commitment to a celibate and faithful service for their reproducing relatives in a seemingly paradoxical evolutionary quirk that defies the adaptive drive for personal reproduction. This is most common in social hymenoptera, the bees, ants, and wasps, wherein hundreds of workers will forego their own personal reproduction in favor of helping a few privileged sisters reproduce more successfully than they could have without the phenomenal and self-sacrificing group effort from the rest of her hive siblings. The reason why these social hymenoptera workers are so willing to sacrifice their own personal reproduction in favor of a few select siblings is because of this previously mentioned coefficient of relatedness or a measure of the genetic similarity between related individuals. These particular insects have a genetic sex determination system that is unique in the animal kingdom, where any fertilized eggs will always be female and unfertilized eggs will always be male. In this way, queens like this one, which the beekeeper has identified with a green dot, will lay fertilized eggs to build an army of female workers, and a few select princesses who will become next year's queens. The males are only produced at the end of the season and are rapidly kicked out of the nest for them to mate with princesses from other families. Having a worker force and the future royals made up entirely of sisters is key to this ultra-altruistic behavior. Because of the way meiosis mixes paternal and maternal DNA when making the gametes, the haploid father of these daughters contributed a uniform genetic mix to them all. Only the mother queen bee would have some genetic variation among her eggs so that the sister offspring are not identical, but 75% genetically similar to one another. This high degree or coefficient of relatedness means that the female worker bees, ants, and wasps have more genes in common with their sisters than they would have with their own offspring, which would be only 50% in common were they to reproduce themselves. Instead, this extreme form of altruistic behavior can evolve in such a way that the inclusive fitness of the worker bees is higher if they help their princess sisters have hundreds of successful offspring each, rather than trying and probably failing at doing so on her own. Because any worker behavior that improves the health and welfare of the overall family colony would be selected for over time, we see the development of specialized castes, within ant colonies in particular, where some sister workers become huge and armored soldiers, others are fast and nimble forager ants. In extreme cases, Specialized castes can lead to workers whose sole role in life is to block the nest entrance using their blunt-shaped head, or others who store nectar in their distended abdomens so that they can feed their busy working sisters by regurgitation, just like a nectar-filled water cooler at the office. All of this family-oriented altruism helps us understand how these extreme hymenopteran sisterhoods could evolve such levels of self-sacrifice for the benefit of their siblings, nieces, and nephews. The bees, ants, and wasps may be an extreme form of kin-based altruism, but it shows that there can be selection that is at play at the genetic level and seems to betray the adaptive value at the Darwinian one. That is, selection may favor individuals in the population to make sacrifices, as long as it means that more of their genes will find their way into the next generation through the improved reproduction of their relatives. Seeing animal behaviors through this lens may also allow us to better understand ourselves as humans. As humans, we also tend to favor helping our own family members before helping other non-related people that we know. 
Whether we're aware of it or not, this behavior would be adaptive in humans as well. Because by helping our family members do better, we may improve our own personal fitness through the indirect selection on those common genes that we share. In our next and final episode, we'll continue to explore animal behavior by pointing the lens at ourselves and seeing how the human animal has evolved to behave adaptively under the same natural selective forces that have shaped the behaviors of our animal cousins and distant relatives.